All right, next up we have Bordello of Blood, the second Tales from the Crypt film. The film that was supposed to launch this into a little bit of a franchise. We're going to have a trilogy with uh, the next one, Ritual. Uh, but because this one bombed so hard, they uh, scrapped that idea. Although, I guess after this probably wasn't making too much money. They just slapped on this little Tales from the Crypt thing, made a really cheap Crypt Keeper opening, and called it a Tales from the Crypt film to sell it. Um, but anyways, let's talk about this movie. Now, this is a movie I haven't seen in like 20 years. Uh, it came out in like, what, 96? And it's 2018, so 22 years old. I want to say I saw it like right around when it came out, like a year or two. So yeah, about 20 years. And I remember like at that time, I would have been like, oh, 15, 16 years old. And I, as I said before, like I'm the target audience. There's like tons and tons. Tons of gratuitous nudity in this movie. I mean, fucking tons. Um, which I very much appreciated <laughs> Appreciated on this viewing. Um, but I did. I kind of sat there and I was like really curious on how I was going to receive this film because I did not like it when I, was, when I was a kid, when I was 15, 16 years old. And so I threw it on and... I was finding myself like 30 minutes in laughing a whole ton and having just a really fun time with this movie. It's very tonally different than Demon Knight. And I think that a lot of people may have went into this expecting Demon Knight. And it's such a drastically different film that uh, their expectations probably weren't met and it was probably shit on. And I can totally get that. But having so much time pass and just kind of going into it with an extremely open mind like I usually do with movies, I ended up, you know, obviously not trying to compare it to Demon Knight because that's just a recipe for disaster. Um, I ended up really enjoying the shit out of this, like a lot. Like, I didn't love it, but I really liked it a lot. Um, I, I thought the comedy, because this is just mostly a comedy, the Demon Knight is a straight-up horror movie with some comedic elements to it, but it's very dark and, you know, has action sequences and, and it takes itself pretty seriously. This one, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. And as I said, I think because they're sequels that people just expected something that was more in line with, the, with Demon Knight. And I just personally don't see how that is possible with Dennis Miller headlining this and Corey Feldman as well, but especially Dennis Miller. I don't think anyone is going to take this seriously if you were to think about it. So I don't know. Maybe that's not what happened, but I know a lot of people did it, didn't like this. But when I did post about it uh, in Killer Flicks, we did get, I did get mostly all praise. Like, oh no, I really like this movie. Or, I love this movie or it's really fun or whatever. So I think that it's come into its own now. It's, you know, it's kind of uh, found its audience like most films do once years have passed. And I think that's going to be true of almost any film that you watch. Uh, if it, it might just not have hit at the time because it wasn't the right audience. It wasn't the right time. It wasn't whatever. Uh, I think most films end up getting that. And it's good to see that this one is getting um, the recognition now because it is funny and it's fun. And um, I think that the writing is fairly solid and the performances are good for what they need to be. It's just uh, fun comedy. So, all right, so we get like a Raiders of the Lost Ark opening here, which I'm not 100% positive if it is supposed to be part of the story we're seeing. I think it is because it has the same character. He gets the same key. He's bringing that girl back from the dead. He's still her servant at the end. But what's weird about that is that the mummy played by William Sadler. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I would have noticed that anyways. Very obvious that it's him, but thank you regardless. Um, he's telling that story. And then 
like he cuts off the crib keeper's hand and then we spin over and there's a lot of recycled jokes seeing as how i just watched all seven seasons of tales from the crypt i remember the majority of the jokes that the crib keeper says at the beginnings and the ends of each episode and i was seeing a ton of recycled jokes here in fact this whole exchange between them of him cutting off parts and all that and switching in between and then coming back and it's just a head and all that that is straight out of a different episode so I, I was like wow you guys really are just plucking jokes i mean mo the majority of jokes that he, the crib keeper says in this are in episodes in the past same puns same setups same everything so i thought that was kind of lame because they should especially with a film and has a bigger budget and has this and that they shouldn't be recycling jokes that's that's really lame to me um but anyway so, so i'm gonna guess it is but it's very odd that the mummy's telling it and then it flips and it's you know uh the crib keeper telling it it's two people but i like that there's this heart in a box little nirvana reference right there um and it's in four separate pieces and it's and it's got it's being separated by this you know these two little wood pieces partitions of sorts and um when he gets it close enough to the body, he pulls it apart and the heart forms together. And I thought that the FX on that heart kind of coming together, even though they're using some CGI in, in this on that, I thought that that was still pretty cool how they like melded together and became a heart and were beating. And then it, like he put it in the chest and it opened up and then she her skin starts to come back. I thought the FX on that were pretty cool. The heart more so than the body coming back together. The body coming back together. There were some moments that I liked it and some moments that I didn't care for it. But overall, I thought that the effects in this film are pretty good. We, we get some fun gore here. Like she rips some dude's head off. There's also a really funny bit where she has this long, super extended tongue. Um, almost like uh, Jesse's in Nightmare on Elm Street 2. When he's with Tina, or uh, not Tina, Lisa, sorry confusing girls in, in the franchise uh, when he's with Lisa in the cabana and he's licking her thing and the big tongue comes out rolls out plenty of other movies but because I'm the Nightmare on Elm Street 2 fanatic <laughs> a Nightmare on Elm Street 2 fanatic who can't even remember girls names I am okay I'm just talking okay it happens um but yeah she gets this, this she, her tongue extends which I've never seen a vampire have like a, a long tongue that's actually used as part of her um, you know, attack, I suppose. She sticks a tongue all the way down the guy's throat and her tongue pushes his heart out of his chest and she just grabs it and eats it and then complains that he's a vegetarian because I guess meat eaters taste better? I don't know. But I just thought that was really like a neat spin and it was a cool effect just seeing her tongue come out and go through his chest and push his heart out of his chest. That was all really fun. And then as I said, she rips off that dude's head that's the recruiter, which I thought the recruiter for that place was hysterically over the top. The best goddamn pussy in the goddamn like that he couldn't have had more exaggeration in his face and in, and in his performance. I, I literally feel like that is as exaggerated as you humanly could be. Uh, but he was making me laugh. Uh, seeing Corey Feldman in this, and I want to say this was like right after he got out of his kid phase and he was being an adult and he had like a, you know, a, a five o'clock shadow and it was weird. He has these really teeny tiny little circular glasses. They're awful. I'm sure they were trying to be hip with that and this is the thing, but they looked so dumb. It was driving me crazy. I was like, take those fucking things off. Um... But uh, I liked him in this. I feel like he was a little underused because he was turned into a vampire in this and then not really used. Like, I don't feel like there was a necessity for that to happen. They didn't really do the impact of his sister seeing that he was dead and now he's a vampire and all this. And he didn't really have a lot of interactions with her for any kind of emotional draw. Now, this is a comedy and that's fine, but I just feel like the point to bring him back would be for that reason or a betrayal or something. But it's just really, he's just a throwaway uh, vampire. He could have been any of the girls and it would have made much of a difference to the plot at all. So I just feel, don't feel like he was 
proper you properly utilized as a character and as an actor because i like Corey feldman um especially at that time like that was more at a time when he was doing uh that was probably close to around the time like eh, a little later but not too far off of like the burbs or something um but i just like him you know i i'm a big fan of Corey feldman in his younger years license to drive and the goonies and you know he has a lot of great roles and people hate him now and you know he went to this they think he's super annoying and he's the band and he has this and that but come on man there was a time when Corey feldman was the shit and i feel like this is still at a time where he was awesome and seeing him in here i, I would have liked to see a little more from him but it was cool seeing him regardless dennis miller is a very interesting choice for the lead in this. Um, I think he does the best of to his abilities. Like he really plays strong off of his strengths. Like he's funny and he's witty and he's fast talking and all that stuff works for him absolutely. Playing like the sexy guy and the tough guy, not so much. That's just not really his thing. I'm not saying he's not a good looking guy. He's fine. Like he's he's fine looking. He's good looking. I mean, not great looking or anything, but. And he's not a badass. Like, I can't take that seriously at all. Dennis Miller is not tough. Um, he's not trying to, like, push people around. He more uses his sarcasm as his um, fighting. But I don't know. There are moments in this where I'm supposed to be taking him seriously as a tough guy. And it just doesn't work for me. Um, so I don't know if he was the proper choice for this. But with his lines and the comedy that he brings to it, he is the proper choice. But that's because he's making the role work for him. Um, maybe even if he's not perfectly casted for it. So uh, yeah, but yeah, this is a collaboration of the writers from Back to the Future, the two writers who did Back to the Future, uh, Zemeckis and Gale, and uh, collaborating with the guys who wrote Children of the Corn 2. Wow. Like <laughs> of the collaborations you think you'd hear of. That's not one of them. You ever watch my Ch uh, Children of the Corn 2 review? What a weird movie. All those Wizard of Oz references and one. It's such a fucking bizarre movie. Um, anyways, there is a lot of Demon Knight references in here. Uh, for one, we have a prop. We got, we got the key straight out of Demon Knight. The key that's, that, you know, the collector's after that Breaker has and gives off to, uh, you know, um, Geraldine. So... Uh, that was pretty cool to see that in here. And I wish that could have been retained in some way in Ritual, just so that we would have that cohesive, like, you know, film to film. But as I said, they scrapped it when they made this. So maybe that was originally in the script. But seeing it was really cool. It's like, oh, they know what that is. Like, I love this, you know, I love Demon Knight so damn much. So to see anything, I wasn't expecting that at all. I don't remember this movie, but like, I was not expecting to see that key. Um, and we've also got a Demon Knight poster in Corey Feldman's room, uh, just right there out in the open. Uh, you know, Tales from the Crypt has always been very meta. They've always acknowledged that it's a TV show and that there's um, that the stories take place in a television series. So they've pointed that out before. In fact, the the, the little guy makes a joke that. You know, he, he pulls out the key and he's like, what is that? I've never seen him. And he's like, you don't go to the movies? Like, this was in Demon Knight. Don't you recognize it? And it plays a pretty prominent role in the movie. Like, it's what contains her. It's what, it's what keeps her at bay. As long as you have that on you, no matter where it is, in a safe or wherever, as long as that thing exists and is, and is controlled by somebody, they can control her, keep her on a leash. So... That actually plays a major role. It's not just like a background prop or something or like something someone pulls out for a second and is like, ooh, look, like, remember Demon Knight? Like, it actually plays a role. It does not have the same properties as it does in Demon Knight, so it's not the same key. But the fact that we see it here, um, I guess you could argue that one of them, this is on a different planet, but that's getting way out there with, with theories and I, I don't even begin to believe that's true as i said there's just an insane amount of nudity i mean this takes place in a bordello and there's prostitutes and they're all naked like every one of them in the movie is not even attempting at getting dressed like they're just walking around completely naked uh, half the movie which is yeah no complaints here 
Um, we got Chris Sarandon in here. Um, and obviously, anytime you're going to think of Sarandon and vampires, you're going to think of Fright Night, not Bordello of Blood. But uh, I think he's really good here because he he ends up being the character that I didn't expect him to be. Like, at first, they play him off at the, as this really hammy, um, you know, evangelicist or something. And he's up on stage on the pulpit and he's a rock guitar guy and you think he's in on this and he even ends up in a in a strip club and whatnot and you're like okay look at the the dirty reverend like they're doing that again like they do in every movie they do that flip where they're like oh well he's a priest but oh he's actually a pedophile or he's actually a you know a smut peddler or he's also he's also you know he deals drugs or he's into women or whatever like and it very much set it up like he was going to be the main bad guy, like he was going to be in control of her, in which he is technically in control of her, but he's not using it for sinister intentions. Like he's keeping her at bay. And so, yes, he's trying to benefit for his church, but at the end, he ends up flipping it and helping Dennis Miller in this fantastic scene of them going around with with like super soakers and shooting holy water on these vampires and them blowing up it's a fantastic scene probably my favorite scene of the entire film because you got nude chicks being sprayed with water and exploding so you got it all um, and it's just a really fun scene the music which is like um uh ballroom blitz by uh was that the ramones or something i can't remember um it yeah that's not the ramones i don't know my damn music i'm a movie person okay ballroom blitz uh is that them <laughs> fuck now i'm like wait um no it's blitzkrieg bop i think that's what i'm mixing up anyways um that's just a kick-ass scene but he does he comes in he ends up giving his life to right the wrongs and i just i didn't expect that twist coming i really just didn't i thought he was just going to be the obvious dickhead and he wasn't and i really liked it and i liked his character he was just that perfect amount of ridiculous that he needed to be for this role him and his lasers and all that. And that's just it. This movie cannot be taken seriously at all. I mean, basically the way they best the, the vampire at the end is by using a, a laser beam from a from a freaking evangelicus television show that burns a cross into her back, which I actually thought was a really neat idea and something I've never seen explored before in the vampire subgenre. The idea of burning a cross into a vampire, like taking a, a cross and heating it up and burning it into a vampire and them actually having a cross on their skin. So they can't just duck it. They can't just push it away. They can't like it's in their skin. There's a cross on them. That's an interesting idea Would that then like blow them up like their body couldn't take it because it was just too much and then explosion i like that idea a lot thinking of burning in across them cool cool uh, little idea there i think it's ridiculous when uh when dennis miller is trying to get out of the bordello he's found his way down there they use a you know it's it's like a a cremation chamber or whatever and they put him in and it like slides down <laughs> which i thought was really cool but he gets out of there by throwing some like drink on the fireplace and climbing up out of the fireplace up into the you know upstairs no one saw him do this somehow even though it's in the middle of the room and when he's up there he has not one single stitch not one single blemish of soot or any kind of dirtiness on his body anywhere yeah, I'm more apt to believe in vampires than that bullshit. <laughs> so, yeah, anyways. Um, and I'm offended that uh, ve uh, vegetarians taste worse than, than meat eaters. Bullshit. Although, hey man, I'm a vegan, so, so maybe I taste awful and they won't want anything to do with me. Hey, even more health benefits. There's me pushing my, my fucking vegan agenda on everybody. I'm not. Eat whatever you want. I don't give a shit. You want to die young? No, I'm just kidding. Um, we got a Whoopi Goldberg little uh, cameo here. It's pretty cool. She's only in it for a second, but yeah, I like Whoopi. Um, and let's see. 
Yeah, and then they, I like that, uh, he burns the cross into her, and then that doesn't fully kill her, but then the girl comes with the, um, it's it's almost like a um, candelabra or something. It's like a three, it, it, almost like a, pick, a, a pitchfork, maybe? I don't know what the hell it is. It has three different spikes on it. She sticks it through, and one of the heart pieces falls into his lap, so he holds it, and then the other three are like skewered, like it's, like it's a freaking... Uh, you know, shish kebab or something, and they're sitting on there. And she pulls it out, and they keep the heart separate. And they have they find the box somehow. I don't know. There it is. They've got the same box, and they put it together. And then we find out that she was a vampire ever since she was hooked up to that freaking you know torture rack or whatever. Um, which I actually didn't expect coming. I thought they were going to get together and that was going to be it. And then they flipped it on you. I should have known with Tales from the Crypt that a lot of these don't end. But Demon Knight actually kind of has a happy ending of sorts. Uh, but this one, nope, nope. Dennis Miller dies and this girl takes over. And the reason that she kills the other chick is because she wants to be the head vampire. She don't want anyone in her way. So she, she gets rid of her the leader. And uh, yeah. So... Uh, I think that's it. I kind of ran all over the place. So I wasn't really looking through my notes. I was just mostly going off memory there. And I didn't even watch it since yesterday. So uh, I didn't expect to talk this long. But it's me. No shocker there. Anyways. All right. I already watched Ritual too. So let's move over to that.